So Hasty, thank you so much for joining me today for this video and uh, you. sharing your story and your testimony, which is so powerful. Uh, you and I have been friends and sisters in Christ for some time now. We follow each other on social media and I recommend that others check out your social media and start following you as well. And all the information is here below on how people can find you on Instagram. So why don't we just dive in and talk about how you came to the theological knowledge that you teach about now. You didn't start out that way, did you? No, not at all. I, I was raised, I'm, I'm from Iran originally. I was raised there as a Muslim. I went to school there for two years. I still remember being in the courtyard before heading to class and chanting death upon America, death upon Israel, wow. which we are taught to do as children in school. That's interesting because we're told that only extremist Muslims are taught that. No, that is, that is a lie. <laughs> okay. okay, interesting. So that little is... children are taught to chant death to America and Israel? Yes. Hmm. It's written all on the walls in, in the schoolyard. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's what I remember. I went, uh, it was two years I went to school there. And, uh, you know, I, uh, my mom was religious and she taught us prayers um arabic prayers that we had to recite and i basically had to memorize it because i didn't understand what it was saying but we just did it and um fast forward when i was around eight my parents decided to move to europe and so we moved to denmark hmm. which is a completely polar opposite yes. country than iran it's very secular very liberal um, but their, their culture is heavily influenced by Christianity. Mm -hmm. So I went to school there and um, I was, uh, I, we celebrated Christmas at school. They took us to church. I was uh, in choir singing about Jesus and singing Christmas carols with no knowledge about who Jesus really is. And it was just a thing we did. We would uh, celebrate Christmas as a Muslim family. Many Muslims do that still. They celebrate mm -hmm. Christmas, but it was a Christless Christmas. It was not about Jesus. It was just a celebration. Um, yeah, so our life in Denmark was just uh, as Muslims. You know, all I mm -hmm. knew is like, I don't, I'm a Muslim. I don't drink. I don't, I don't dress provocatively or I don't... Uh, um, eat pork or whatever mm -hmm. but the funny part is that my dad was anti all that so he would drink he would so it was very it was uh, it was confusing you know so your mother was devout but your father was more of a rebel yes <laughs> okay. yes um and so fast forward again when i was around 17 my parents decided to to divorce mm -hmm. and so um my mom decided to move from denmark to canada so my brother and I, we came here with my mom and our life began all over. And not until a year and a half later where my mom, where my mom was into, she was searching. She was searching a lot about, um, about the truth. She wanted peace. She was just restless and um, she needed she needed peace with God and forgiveness, and she was seeking it all over the place. She even went to Mecca when she was in Denmark, and she came back even more confused and mm. more, um, more upset that that's not where the truth was. She did not feel peace. She didn't so find she, the answer she was looking for at Mecca, of all places, huh? Not at all. Yeah, so that, huh. was, that was the end of Islam for her. Interesting. In many, yeah. And so she came to Canada, and uh, she started going to Buddhist temples, to Sikh temples. She even to, went to um, a Scientologist, uh, uh, you know, those yeah. offices they have. Sure. And she was going everywhere. And we were witnessing all this, my brother and I. And we're like, oh my gosh, here we go. She, you know, he was another <laughs> religion that right. she's... And it was just normal to us. It wasn't anything, anything odd. We were just like, she's just searching, then whatever, mm -hmm. good for her. And uh, not until a year and a half later that a friend of hers uh, invited her to go to church. So she decided to go because why not? She would join a friend and on a Sunday and uh, she went to church and uh, during the worship, she was really, she was really touched by the words 
that it was about God. It was about God being our creator, God being our, our refuge, our peace, and how he's, he's, he's the one that saves us from everything bad. And so she, she, that's, that's what she needed to hear. And that's, Mm -hmm. I think that's what she yearned to hear that Mm -hmm. God is our safety and, um, he loves us and all that, but she wasn't, she wasn't preached the gospel. She wasn't, they didn't share the gospel with her that day. Um, and I think this is where the sovereignty of God comes in and Mm -hmm. how he works and how he regenerates us. And that regeneration precedes faith is that God was changing the disposition of her heart or had changed the disposition of her heart and touched her in a way and given her the gift of faith so that after that time at church, she, she just went home and wanted to really read the Bible. And so Mm. she started reading the Bible and she came to believe that Jesus was Lord and that she submitted to she submitted herself to Christ and believed that he was God. And she started, um, she started sharing with us slowly. And I was a little annoyed. I'm like, I don't want to hear it. You know, she would share Bible verses and we'd just laugh at her and call her, oh, you're so holy mom or, you know, and so. You were, you were used to her just having a revolving door of spirituality. Yes. And so you didn't really trust this was it. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I think it was um, one, t- one day I was sitting and doing homework and she was on the couch reading the Bible. And she said, uh, Hassie, did you know that if you come to Christ, all your sins will be forgiven? And that's when the whole world stopped for me because I was so needing forgiveness. I was so yearning for forgiveness from my past and from shame and guilt. And I was just, and I just looked at her, I'm like, what do you mean? all my sins, mm-hmm, you know, like, mm-hmm. and she's like, all your sins. And I was like, uh, I just, I just, it just stuck with me. And so, that, so you did have a belief in sin. You did have a belief that you had made mistakes against God. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. I didn't know there were sins. Mm-hmm. I knew that I had been bad. Okay. That I was, um, that was wrong in many ways mm-hmm. and that I had done wrong things but I didn't know that that was sin against God. And so during that time, I was, uh, a friend of mine was going through some difficult times. So I said to myself, I'll just go with mom to church and I'll go to pray for this person. So I went to church with her and uh, I don't really remember the, the service. <laughs> I don't remember what it was about because you have to understand, I didn't understand Christianity at all. This mm-hmm. was completely foreign to me. And, uh, so I went up to pray because you would line up to go up. There was people praying for you there. And I said, oh, I'm just here to pray for my friend. And uh, they said, uh, oh, are you saved? And I'm like, saved? I have no yes. idea what that means. I understand. You know, and I'm like, no. And they're like, well, for you to pray for someone, you have to be saved yourself. Mm. So you have to be out of the hole that you're in to help your friend out. So that made sense to me, right? Sure. I'm like, uh-huh. sure, yeah, I want to get them out of the hole. It's not about me, though, right? Yes. It's about my friend. And so they said, well, you need to say this prayer after us. Okay, there, was, there were two people. And so I said, okay. I don't even remember being told I was a sinner. I don't remember being told. I was not sure of the gospel. Mm-hmm. I was just told to repeat a prayer. Mm. And so I, you know, I accepted Jesus into my heart and asked him to forgive me and uh, to help me lead a good life. And then after I said that, I was, they were so happy and I'm like, why are they so happy? And they're like, you're saved. I can't believe you said this. And this is a beginning of something amazing. And so I'm, I'm completely in a fog. I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, I was sent home. I mean, that was it. I went home and my mom was obviously, my mom thought like I had become a Christian. So she was. Let me stop you though for a second. I want to make sure I understand this. So your mom and you are going to two separate churches though. You're going with your friend. The same church. It's the same same church. church. Okay. Okay. All right. So your mom thinks that you've been saved. You've been told you're saved. You don't even know what that means. And there's no follow up. No. Yeah. So I just 
continued to go to church after that. You know, the, the thing is that they are so warm and so friendly and so um, engaging that you go back because they love you. You know, you go back because you made friends now, you're, you're loved, appreciated, and paid attention to. And, you know, it was, it was entertaining, right? You go and, but I started reading the Bible on my own. Good. Because I wanted to know, I wanted to know what I was, what it was all about. Mm -hmm. But later it was, um, you know, you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you have, and then, so I'm like, and again, I have not known anything else. So anything they tell me, I will believe because Mm -hmm. they know better. Mm -hmm. So, okay, if you say as a pastor, I have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, then I'm going to submit to that. So they said, in addition to water baptism, you had to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, similar to the Pentecost at Acts. Oh yeah. And then I had to speak in tongues. Okay. This is so before they're my giving you requirements baptism. that aren't in the Bible. Oh yeah, yeah. But I didn't know any mm-hmm. any of that. So to me, that was all normal. So I uh, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I was told to repeat, and they were like, "Oh, words are gonna come out. Words are gonna come out, and just 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 yield to them." And I'm like, "There is nothing coming out." And so the pastor said, "Just repeat after me." So he started praying in tongues. And said, just repeat after me. So I started saying what he was saying. So I started, you know, my tongue was mm-hmm. very similar. To his. And so this was not a foreign language, like in Pentecost in Acts, no. people understood what was being said. This mm-hmm. was, this was more along the lines of syllables that you were saying yeah. that were not a language. Was Just repeating words. Yeah. The Bible says that that when tongues are spoken, there must be an interpreter. Was there an interpreter? No. Never. No. No. Even, well, I'll get into that, but during prayer meetings, there would always be people. Before praying, um, there would be just, everybody would speak in tongues, and then people would start praying. So there was never any order or following what the Bible says, which is two or three max. Right. And then there has to be interpretation. No. So that, that started happening and, you know, ooh, I received, <laughs> I speak in tongues now, then I was water baptized and it just, I was, you know, I was happy. My zeal for Jesus was, you know, at a 10 and, um, but I, it, it's really embarrassing, but I didn't know what the gospel was this whole time. I had no idea that I was under God's wrath that that is why Jesus came to reconcile me with God. And that I didn't know that Jesus died on the cross to take my sins on him and give me his righteousness. I just thought he loves me so much that he died for me. That's mm. all I knew mm. that I'm so lucky that I'm, I decided to make this decision. Mm. So I'm just, I'm awesome for having decided this. I'm so smart having to, having, had the brilliance of choosing God, right? So it was all about my great decision. Mm -hmm. And I just, uh, I went to that church for, since I was, I think I was 19 and it continued for 15 years and on. Would you say that that church was charismatic or hyper charismatic? Um, Now that I look back, I would say hyper charismatic. Mm -hmm. Because people there was were people, prophecies, oh, oh. Yeah, prophecies and um, speaking in tongues and um, people were falling over oh. during prayer. You know, there was catchers and um, I even had that experience because you are, you, it, it's that feeling that if, if everybody's doing it, it's normal. Mm. And if you don't do it, it's not normal. So mm-hmm. you're, what is, why are you so prideful that you wouldn't give in to the Holy Spirit? If that's what he wants, he wants you to fall over, then you need to fall over. Was there a sense when you're falling over, Hasti, that it was a force or was it more of a decision? It was definitely a decision to give in to the emotions. Mm. Because during these prayer times, there was always music in the background. Okay. Uh-huh. There's always music. There was always someone 
before the sinner's prayer was said, the person would walk, this person would walk up and start playing the piano, which I never really understood. I'm like, what's with the piano in the background? But, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so not that there's was, anything wrong with music playing at churches, but it's why is it being used? And yeah. it sounds like you're saying that it was hypnotic or kind of trance, trance inducing music. Yeah, it's very emotional. So, mm -hmm. and you, the thing is you're going and you're praying for your personal emotional needs, right? And yeah. so you're emotional, you're praying over something that you need, you want. So you're already in tears and wanting God to answer you. So then the music in the background just intensifies mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm you know? Yeah. We, in the new age, we did things like that with drumming and, and just the rhythmic beats that would put you in a trance state and it would make you vulnerable to demonic infiltration. Yeah. Yeah. So I started, it wasn't until I would say maybe two, three years ago where little things had kind of crept in the back of my mind where I thought something's off. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand that. I didn't, I would, I would sit and listen to sermons and the name, the word gospel would come up and I would say to myself, I don't know what the gospel is. Mm -hmm. Like, why am I not being taught that during, mm -hmm. during Sunday? Like, why isn't it being talked about? Or someone would say, Oh, you know, they shared Jesus. And I'm like, why don't I share Christ? I don't know how to share about my faith. So all these things. And then slowly I would be like, well, why is the sermon not about Christ? Mm -hmm. Why are they talking about me, my problems, how I can, how I can better my life, how I can become a better person, how I can be better with people? Why are there so many props? Why is there video clips? Why is there um, gimmicks? Why is it a joke all the time? So it was almost like, because I was used to, um, even in Denmark when we went to church, it was a much more respectable way of when you're at church, they were reading something, even if I didn't understand mm -hmm. it, I had this respect where I'm like, you know, listening. There's a, there's a reverence that you were used yeah. to. And so you, yeah. in Denmark, you were going to a Christian church. You didn't really understand it, but it was more cultural there. And, yeah. and in the meantime, now you're at this hyper charismatic church, you're reading the Bible, mm -hmm. you're, you're hearing the word gospel, but not the gospel itself. The, uh, the sermons are all about applications and psychology, and it's a social club more than, um, more than a so about people. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're very much about people. I've noticed that in some churches um, about page is that it really starts with we love people. And, yeah. and I mean, that's one of the great commandments is that we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves, but, but it's the context, isn't it? But love and, them how? If yes. you're not preaching the gospel to them, that's not love. Thank that's, you. You know, that's just a secular social club that anybody can open. And it's comforting you know? them in their sins. It's letting them know that, oh, you don't have to change. You don't have to repent who you are. God loves you just like you are. You know, you're fine. Keep, keep having adultery and, and getting drunk and, you know, do all that stuff because God loves you. Yeah, and, just come to church. And, and just come to church and be entertained. Yeah. And that's not love. <laughs> that's not no. love. What's love, like you said, is having the risk of offending someone by sharing the real full gospel with them. Yes. I, I just recently actually heard, um, heard a message from that pastor and they were, it was in front of thousands of people. And they said, um, you know, their way of introducing or presenting the gospel was that, you know, we're all broken people, which is true. Yeah. Um, we are filled with anger, resentment, anxiety, worries, and, and uh, you know, we have cold hearts. And this is why Jesus came into the world, to come and give you peace and to turn mm -hmm. that coldness into warmness. He came to turn that anger uh, into you know, a desire to want to do good and not be angry, uh, anxiety, he's going to take it away. He's going to give you joy. He's going to give you peace. So if you allow God to come into your heart, if you allow him, he will come and he will make your life better. But if you decide that you 
you're not going to allow him into your life. That's your decision. And that was, that's how it ended. Mm -hmm. So that's my decision. But why isn't, why isn't the consequences of my decision being explained to me? Exactly. If I don't repent and put my trust in Christ, I will end up in hell. Yep. There is no mention of hell. There is no mention that one day everybody will stand before a righteous and holy and just God and that we will be judged mm -hmm. either on our own for our own righteousness that we do not possess or on uh, you know or it's about another person's righteousness and that's Christ mm -hmm. it's Christ's righteousness that we need they don't explain that it's just that you know we you get to choose you get to choose if you want Jesus or not and if if you decide not to then that's just too bad and, but it's and, a bad and, if choice. Do, and they're saying if you do choose it's all about this life now your best life now and your best life now you'll have peace you'll have joy your best life now which is true i mean he did say my peace i live with you but that's not the point of the gospel that's like a and, that's a benefit and, that's a side benefit yeah and the thing is that i know a lot of people from that church that they they've been going to that church for many years and They've lost money. They've lost a lot of things. And they're upset with God mm. because he did not come through to, for them the way they were promised. That if you tithe, God will bless you. And that's another thing that uh, it really, it's really upsetting talking about it because, you know, one time my mom went to, because she was struggling financially, because she was single mom and divorced and starting over in a new country so she went to this pastor and said um you know i'm put i don't have money to tithe i don't i barely have enough for rent and food and everything uh, so i'm putting my tithes on my visa card mm. with a really high interest is that okay and i i was standing behind her just waiting to see what she was going to say and she, and she said yes you keep paying your tithes and God will pay off your debts. Oh, God, wow. God will come through for you. Mm. And in my, I didn't know much about theology then, but that didn't make any sense no. to me. I was like, why would God want my mom to go in debt so he could get her out of debt to just to prove that? I, it just made no sense. No, the Bible says we're not supposed to go in debt. We're supposed to be wise with our resources. And of course, bring the first fruit is, is Old Testament. It just, after Malachi... Um, there's no requirement in the New Testament to tithe the 10%. We are supposed to support those who, um, who nurture us, or our pastors and our churches. And absolutely. the early church, you know, absolutely, we see lots of precedents through Acts and Paul's letters of the early church giving financial support to help other believers. But this whole thing about put, put, the, put the seed money or the tithe on your visa card and God will get you out of debt. Those kind of promises are never biblical, Old or New Testament. If you tithe, you will avoid, uh, if there's ever an earthquake, your home will will stand because God will protect you in a oh way. Oh my goodness. You they know, can't if make promises like that. Oh, they do. They that's, do. That is, that's spiritually dangerous for them. I'm afraid for their souls. Yeah. So it's So these little things that was just like, in the back of my mind, it made no sense. Mm. There was, um, I remember being, um, I was uh, at a service in another campus once, and that campus was uh, a lot of poor people, addicts, and um, you know, we, I, I arrived to church and it was, I found out it was a movie month. Mm. So we were to watch a movie. And that alone was like, why um, Why did I get up in the morning, got myself ready to come to church to watch a Hollywood movie with Kevin Costner? Oh, I, really? So not a Christian movie? No. Um, no. A, a secular movie? Yes. On a Sunday morning? Yes. Oh. And as I was sitting there watching this movie, I looked around and I see these people who are in addictions, who are mm -hmm. just needing to hear, yeah. you know, the truth about the gospel, about what what they need to be set free from their mm -hmm. sins. And, and that just broke me. I was looking around. I'm like, this cannot be 
what church is about. This mm-hmm. is not okay. This is, they're supposed to be, they're here to hear the word of God. That's right. And we're watching Kevin Costner. That was the end. That was the end for me. Mm. I went home and uh, I, you, I went on YouTube and I searched, when is it okay to leave the church? Because mm. I, I didn't know what to do. And I remember Todd Frill, Wretched Radio came up. Oh my goodness. And it was he, like, <laughs> yeah, he's pretty intense for your first kind of reformed <laughs> video to watch. Yes. So it was like, I think it was like nine points about when to leave a church. And it okay. was, it was exact. It was like man centered preachings. It was like all about you. Mm-hmm. About everything I was going through, it was just like, oh my goodness, this cannot be real. And then you know how other videos pop up that are sure. similar? Then yeah. Justin Peters showed up. Oh, good. And I clicked on it and uh, he was talking about Joyce Meyer. He was talking about Stephen Furtick, Beth Moore, all the people that my church endorsed. Mm. And this was like, I was, I was nauseous because I was like, I didn't really believe that my church was that far off. I just thought, you know, this is not something I want. I want something different. Mm -hmm. But then I was proof that this is, this is wrong. And I I felt like 15 plus years of this has been a lie. You're telling me I've been lied to. Mm -hmm. I've been told the truth about what the gospel is, about what Christianity is. And I felt like it was, it was like a, it was a shock. Yes. And so I started, it was like, I couldn't stop listening to Justin Peters. So did you, at some, some level you knew that this was the truth? Yes. You had, you had read enough of the Bible that you recognized that what they were saying, and, and they, they do back it up with scripture, that this was the truth. Yes. And so I started listening, and I, I started talking to my mom about it. I'm like, Mom, you know they're saying that Joyce Meyer is, this is not, and Beth Moore, and all the, you know, Lisa Bevere, John mm-hmm. Bevere, all the people that, Joel Osteen mm-hmm. is one of the, you know, he endorses my old church, which mm-hmm. is, a sign in itself that if Joel Osteen endorses a church and if you endorse them, something's wrong. Right. You know, if your church sells Kenneth Copeland and, you know, something's not right. The word of faith teachers who say you can name it and claim it. And, and that's it, another it, thing. We had, we, <laughs> it was, um, we were being taught to name it and claim it. We were being taught that our words have power. Uh, we were being taught that if you, you know, if you want a piano, you just, you, you decide where it's going to go in your home and you're just going to start, start vacuuming around it and mm. say, thank you, God, for my piano and God will provide oh, it for you. Wow. That's exactly what we would do in the new age, Hasty. Exactly. I mean, based on Norman Vincent Peale and Emmett Fox type of teachings, the same thing that you're talking about. It's, it's, it's scary. I mean, I believed it then. I believed it. And I would, you know, they would say, they would say you would see something, you know, in front of you or in a, in a magazine, a nice home or a nice guy. <laughs> and you'd say, I claim that. Oh, wow. I claim that in Jesus name. And if it's God's will, I'll get it. You know, I just claim it because God wants me to have the best things. And so what would happen to people's faith when they wouldn't get the piano or that guy or whatever? Well, you don't have enough faith. Oh, so it's, it's your fault. Yeah. And so everything's like based on free will, then you decide to accept Jesus. You are the one who has to have faith. And so it's very man centered, like you said. Yeah. I remember my mom going up for prayer once and, and healing is another thing that always was in the back of my mind. Cause I had knee pains. I had back pains. Hmm. I never got healed from that. Really? I'm not saying I, I am not a proponent to say God doesn't heal. I believe hundred percent God still heals. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's his will, he will heal you. But I don't believe that someone can come and demand you to be healed in Jesus name. And that's what we were told. You were so told my, to demand. Yes, you rebuke and you bind and you believe that sickness has no authority over your body. Wow. And so you just rebuke it and you demand sickness to leave. Did you ever see that work for anyone? Not personally, no. Um, I remember my mom going to a pastor and asking, she's been, she'd been struggling with chronic coughing for a long time. 
And she goes up and she says, you know, I've been coughing for a long time. And I just, I don't know. She was struggling with why she wasn't being healed. You know, uh, you are telling me that we can command this sickness to go. It's not going, you know, what, are, what is going on? And she believed that you had to be healed because that's what she's being taught. And so this pastor said, well, it's either you don't have enough faith or you're in sin. So these were the only two solutions for her. And it's they were both that, about her, not about God's will. Exactly. So it's like, what if, what if it's, what, what if it's not God's will to heal? Mm -hmm. You know, that's ne no, it's always God's will to heal you, which is a huge lie because that can cause someone to really lose faith mm -hmm. in, in the goodness of God, you know, because, or in, I would always, I would always question myself saying, why, why don't oh, I have such little faith that my knee isn't getting better? Mm. I mean, they prayed for it. I really just have to keep it. You know, I have to believe that it's better and not, not speak it. We don't speak, you know, you don't say that I'm not healed. So. Wow. So new age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. So some, a lot of people don't realize unless they study the Bible that part of God's love and mercy sometimes involves us suffering. suffering. He allows us to suffer as a gift. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it's to draw us to him, to, yeah. to motivate us to bend to him and yeah. to need him and to give him glory. Yes. But your yeah. church that you're describing, your former church, Sounds like it was all about giving people glory. Yes. It's always about people. It's always, it's always about how can we meet people's needs and make them happy so that they'll come back. You know, they, they, will, never, they will never say anything that will make you feel bad about yourself when, you, when you're leaving church. You will never leave there thinking, I'm a wretched sinner. Mm -hmm. I am at enmity with God, God's wrath is on me, I need to repent. Mm -hmm. Or I'm in, I'm in this kind of sin, I need to repent of it. Uh, no. And, there's, and the, also there was no church discipline at, at all. There was no church discipline. People mm -hmm. were doing whatever they were doing and everybody knew about it and nothing. Okay, so you're, you know? you're in this church where they make up their own rules and it's all about people. And they won't offend anyone because then people might not come back. Yes. You know, unfortunately, the more people in your church, the more money. Hmm. And that's what it's about. You know, I, I say this because I'm not saying it because I am angry or spiteful of them. It's not that. I am telling you from experience that I had family members and friends go to that church. I remember uh, one event where I, I believe it was John Bevere was there one time mm. preaching. And um, mm -hmm. I used to follow him. <laughs> oh yeah, me too, mm. a lot. Mm. And Lisa Bevere. Mm -hmm. um, he was there and at the end, you know, they put on the music and uh, people, all the kids, it was like a, for youth. And all the young people were in front just crying and wanting to accept Jesus and, or renew their, you know, relationship with Christ or, and I had a friend there. Um, she was, uh, she was into Buddhism. Her mom was, I believe, Sikh. And, um, she was really emotional at that point. She was doing, uh, she was going through a lot of problems and she was very emotional. And someone had said, uh, had asked her if she wanted to be saved and say the sinner's prayer. And during that time, she had done that. She said yes, and she did that. I didn't know because there were so many people. I was somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And um, before I was leaving, one of the female pastors came up to me and said, did you know your friend accepted Christ? And I'm like, what? I'm like, wow, that's amazing, right? Like, I'm not believing it, but that's crazy. If God saved her, that's awesome. So I go to her the day after. Um, she went home. I went home. I didn't talk to her about it. So I called her. I'm like, so they said you accepted Christ. What's going on? She started crying. She's like, Hassie, I don't believe that. Mm. I was emotional. I was 
I was kind of, you know, corks coaxed yep, into yep, it, you know? Yep. I was, um, I don't believe it, she said. Mm. And I'm just like, what? Like, what is going on then? Why would so they say? It was a false conversion then. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, okay, so that pastor who said your friend, you know, is a believer, why didn't you follow up with her? Mm-hmm. Why exactly. is there no follow up? And the, say, the thing is, this, this wasn't just her. It happened to even a few family members of my husband's family members. They mm-hmm. came, they were going through hard times. They came to church a few times because we asked them to come with us and they did. And we told them, you know, come to church. God would change your heart. God, God would change your life. And that's what we knew to say. Mm-hmm. They came, they went up for prayer. They said the sinner's prayers. They even, some of them were baptized in water. Mm-hmm. What about it? And uh, they were never followed up with. They never went back. And now to this day, they do not believe. They do not, they, they do not say they're a Christian. They do not follow Christ. Mm. And it's, and I'm like, I always think I'm like, do they even care about those people that they said you're saved? Right. Do they even care what's going on with them now? If you know. Yeah. yeah that's I why what you're it's... saying. There's a, there's some popular preachers who will publish the numbers of people who get saved at their rallies, and and you you wonder how many are in, like you're describing, just fueled by adrenaline and maybe social pressure in the moment and but they're not told the full gospel. They're not told why. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're not told about repentance. Just please forgive me, God. You know, that's not, that's not true contriteness of the heart. No, that's not true. There's no repentance. There's Mm -hmm. no understanding um, that, you know, uh, this reminds me again of uh, my mom's friends called her from, from Iran. And they said, you know, we were shared about Jesus and, and, you know, ever since we've, we've been talking to this person who's been sharing Jesus with us, our life has been so much better. We have so much peace and we just really love Jesus. And, uh, and my mom was like, oh, really? And then I said to her, well, you need to ask that if, okay, if you, you claim you love Jesus and that you, you've given your life to Jesus and all that, would you still love Jesus if your child died tomorrow? Would you still love Jesus if something horrible happened? Right. Jesus is not a magical, you know, prayer or person or God that you can just um, invite into your life to make you feel better, to make you, um, you know. Yeah, no, he's not a wish granter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so this is when you know that the person hasn't been shared the gospel. Yes. Right? Because Mm -hmm. they think it's all about me feeling better, my life being happier, I have more joy, I have peace, and it's all because of Jesus. And that's true, mm-hmm. but that that is not the end of it. That is not the whole of the gospel. Exactly. And it's yeah. not the, the real Jesus part of the time. I mean, I thought I was following Jesus my whole life, but it was a caricature. I was following myself and who I wanted Jesus to be. Yeah. And when we read about the biblical Jesus, it's completely different than this worldly idea that that he's all inclusive and that you can do whatever you want as long as you're positive and happy. That's not the real Jesus. No. And I remember, you know, we were I met my husband at church and um he he came from a very secular background as well. He's Brazilian. And um you know, Catholic background, mm-hmm. but never practicing anything. So, you know, I told him, I'm like, we're not going to, there's nothing going to happen here physically. And so he didn't understand why. So I said, you know what, I can explain it to you, but I think it's best if you go to one of the pastors and talk to them about it. So I'm thinking, mm-hmm. okay, this pastor is going to open up, you know, the Bible yes. and tell him straight. Right. So he goes and has coffee with this pastor and he's like, well, why can't I sleep over at my girlfriend's house? Why can't I be with Hasty? Um, So he's just talking about sleeping over. Yes. Right. Not Uh having sex, just sleeping over. Yep. And the, and the pastor says, well, you don't want to sleep over at your, your girlfriend's house because when you're sleeping, you might, 
while you're sleepy, try to do something with her and you don't want to do that. How is that a biblical answer to someone who's seeking, asking about purity, about why he needs to remain, you know, pure right. before marriage? So that was the person's answer. And so, so Pe my husband says, Petra says, well, where in the Bible does it mm -hmm. say that I can't, you know, sleep with my girlfriend? And uh, he said, well, let me get back to you on that. Oh, so the pastor didn't know. No. And didn't look it up. I mean, he could have no. looked it up no. right no. then. No, oh, he boy. said, I'll email it to you. I, I'll email you some verses. That's. Yeah. So, so it, he just, gave him psychological answers. Yeah. And it's like, how can you not, as a pastor, mm -hmm. have clear answers and biblical truths and you know, an answer yes. to someone who's flat out asking you. Mm -hmm. And why you know, that is. Yeah. And why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And, wow. Yeah. I can and go so into you... about a lot of things. Why? Yeah. It just sounds like your eyes are just being opened and, and your I husband's mean, there eyes. Were, there were unbelievers marrying Christians. Mm. You know, there was a Muslim man marrying a, a Christian who was mm. attending the church. Uh -huh. How? How is that okay? I don't know. And they married them in the church? Yeah. The unequally yoked people were married in the church? Yeah. Wow. Oh, my goodness. So what? at what point, so you'd watch the Todd Priel video about why to leave your church. You're recognizing, oh, my goodness, that's what my church teaches. There's all of these red flags. At what point do you say, I'm out of here? Here's the thing. It was really difficult to leave because this was the first church I've ever attended. I've built so many relationships with people. I have so many friends, so many memories, and I love these people. Yes. And so if I say I'm leaving, it's, um, it's basically saying we're done. We're all done. I don't believe what you are teaching is right. So you know what I mean? So you're it was, giving up friendships. Yeah. And, th and that's another thing. They keep you. It's all about fellowship and friendship. Mm -hmm. And so you're invested. Your, your whole life is invested in that alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you, go, if you leave, if you pull out the plug, you're alone. Mm. And so it's not easy to just leave. No. But I was going so crazy in my head Sunday after Sunday that I couldn't, I couldn't stay anymore. Mm -hmm. So I told, and I, and I drove my husband crazy because I, every Sunday I'm like, this cannot be real. I mean, where was the Bible preached? Right. Why was it, you know? Yep. And he's like, either do something about it or shut <laughs> up. <laughs> so I started, um, I started looking around and um, it wasn't until um, we left that church and we went to another church that was a really, it was a great church. It was a Bible preaching church and, um, but it wasn't a reformed church. And while I was going to that church, I was discovering reformed theology mm -hmm. yep. and it was, I was just convinced that is going back to sound biblical doctrines mm -hmm. and truths. And I wanted that. I wanted the sound doctrines. I wanted expository preaching yes. i wanted i wanted sound theology and that church was sound in many ways but it mm -hmm. wasn't reformed and which is one of the one of the reasons we left that church mm -hmm. um but the good thing about social media is that you make friends and i yes. have made friends with with one person with many people but this one person i said i need a church that is reformed and i don't know where to go i can't find any here so this person researched and found a church that was kind of this there his pastor was um was friends with my pastor now and they okay. went to the same seminary so he sent me the the website to their to that church that i attend now um and uh so i it was i remember it was saturday night we were at my mom's house and i i looked up the church i went on youtube and i listened to the pastor i'm like He's preaching on Job. He's preaching like about suffering. And I was like, mm -hmm. this is so right. Yeah. <laughs> I mm -hmm. need to go see this person and hear this. And so we decided to go to that church that following Sunday. And that's where we just, wow, it, I was blown away. And 
it turned out that it was the right decision. Mm -hmm. It was everything I needed. Sound doctrine, sound theology, church discipline. They sing hymns. <laughs> yes. <I love laughs> and it hymns. touches your soul. Right. And it's just, there's, there's fellowship. There is, there is accountability. There is, um, I, I mean, it's just everything mm -hmm. a church should be. Mm-hmm. Now, um, people in the charismatic movement, I'm sure you've heard this too, Hasty, say that such churches as we're describing are dead spiritually, that there's mm -hmm. no Holy Spirit in such a church. What would you say to them? You know, it's funny because I've heard my old pastor say that, you know, unless you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you don't have power. And I didn't understand it. Even, when, even then, I, I was like, what do you mean? Like... The Holy Spirit has to help you to become saved. So where does he go after, you know, I'm saved? How mm -hmm. do I not have power? And, and now I think about it. I'm like, look at John MacArthur. Look at R.C. Sproul. How can you say with um, the ministries, the way they're affecting millions around mm -hmm. the world, that they don't, that they're dead and they don't have power. Mm -hmm. And by saying that, basically you're saying that because they only preach the word, uh, the church is dead. How is that even possible? How can right. you say something like that? Because they don't use props because they don't have a rock band on stage because people aren't jumping up and down on stage, you know, with six inch heels and tight yes. pants. That's that, then the church is dead. It just makes absolutely no sense to me. I hear you. I feel the same way. Going to reform church um, has deepened my walk with Christ um, in a way that I could not have foreseen. I'm mm -hmm. so glad I'm there. And, and it doesn't have the new age nonsense, like you said. It doesn't have the, the people calling themselves prophets or uh, the false teachings. We, we, uh, Michael and I, we had gone to a church where they did use Beth Moore um, teachings. And I kept saying to the Bible study leader, I kept saying, I think she's a false teacher. And they, and people said, no, 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 she's fine. She's fine. But looking back, I'm shocked that I was going to what was considered a solid church that was offering for the women in the Bible study, Beth Moore yeah. teachings. Yeah. And, and I'm so glad to be away from that and be in a church that um, is, is steeped in the whole yes. Bible. And like you said, expository teachings and yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I remember um, I used to work for a Christian company and um, what they would, they would show um, the clients there that were there um, clients, I guess they were um, residents, I would say who were living there. Um, they would show them TD Jakes, Creflo Dollar, Joyce Meyer, wow. um, Joel Osteen. I mean, Kenneth Copeland, every single false teacher was basically in that home being preached, mm. uh, being, being taught as a sound preacher. Mm. And, uh, I remember they would, they brought a prophet Tess in to prophesy over the staff once. And by then I was kind of like, ah, I don't know about this prophesying thing, but because everybody said yes, and they stood in line and she went to each one of us, I, I just submitted to it and said, okay, and I never forget, she, she came to me and she said, um, you hate divorce. And I'm thinking, who loves divorce? Like, mm -hmm. how kind of prophecy is that? That, okay, yeah, I hate divorce. And then she said, you know, I can just see you're going to become, uh, your ministry is going to be reconciliation. Well, hmm. isn't every believer supposed to have that yes. ministry, which is to reconcile the sinner to a holy God? I, That's right. I mean, they say the stuff that is so ge generic and yep. that is so, and we, I was still kind of like, what? But everybody there was, yeah, oh my gosh, like you hate divorce. And I'm like, do you love it? I don't understand. Like, <laughs> it just makes no, no the prophets, they're nothing like the biblical prophets who were always calling Israel to back to come back to the covenant and to repent and stop worshiping these idols. And the prophets today, the people call themselves prophets, they are all about pandering to the ego, the smooth talkers that Paul was warning about. You know, they, they, uh, they, and they always drop um, Esther 4.4 4 or 4.14 4 
uh, you're made for such a time as this. They always drop that in there to flatter your ego and make yeah. you think that you're special and, and such. Yeah. And oh my goodness, yeah. Yeah. There was... being, a, being a former false prophet myself from the new age, I can see it so clearly oh. and I get so frustrated when people can't see it. Yes, yes. And I'm so grateful for you. Oh, thanks. And yeah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> he just, he opened my eyes to the truth and it, it's like, what was I used to believing? I can't even recognize my old self. So how often do you read the Bible now, Hesty? You know, I am not going to lie. I read the Bible. I try my best to read it every day, but uh -huh. when I don't, I do listen to it online on, on audio. Yep. I have an audible account. So I have a Bible, the whole Bible downloaded on that. So you either and listen to it or read it daily. Yes. Yes. And I try to, I know another video I would recommend everybody to listen to is uh, Stephen Lawson, Impromptu Gospel. Yeah. Stephen Lawson is underrated, but he's so, um, he's such a dynamic teacher. Yeah. He is really, um, the way he explains the gospel is so um, it puts your heart on fire. You just want yes. to, you want to share it with everybody and it gives you courage to share it with everyone.